Well, not so. I think it's off. Let's see. Something need to be turned up, turned on here. It's not on. Is it on now? Nope. So, is it working now? <laughs> but it really brought up a thought that's very valuable to me. And that is, my temperament is such, or maybe it's just my gnarly, mentally afflicted mind. I don't like waiting. I just don't like waiting. India, I don't like waiting. India is always a, ch a challenge for me. Because the national mantra is, when you go to a bank or anywhere, the national mantra is, just wait. Just wait. How long? Just wait. <laughs> and you either get used to it or you don't. You know, that's just the way it is. It's not, not a bad thing or a good thing, but just wait. I don't like waiting. But then I don't wait anyway. I can't remember the last time I waited. Because waiting is not a posture is a mind state of unfilled, unfulfilled desire. And I don't like unfulfilled desire. I like fulfilled desire. <laughs> so if the microphone's not working, I always have something to do. What else is it going to do? I start meditating, and I have immediate gratification. And if the microphone doesn't come on, tough luck. <laughs> we will now have an hour and a half session. You know, what's the problem? So whether it's coming to a stoplight, or whether it's in the doctor's office, the dentist, or in the bank, or whatever, where other people are waiting, I just don't. I don't cut the queue. I just don't wait. And I just start practicing, doing something I enjoy doing anyway. And you can do it standing, walking, sitting down, or lying. So I find that, I find that very, very useful. And then I don't have to wait anymore. I don't like waiting. So we're going to go back to this meditation and fill in one missing piece that may not be missing, but it's easy to overlook. And moreover, uh, thank you for setting up the microphone so we had to look like we're waiting there for a minute, because it's very germane to what we're about to do. And that is, when you're focusing your awareness on the space of the mind, whatever comes up, time and again, as you're attending as closely as you can to this domain of the mind, on occasion, you just may not see anything. I mean, there's just no stuff coming up, not an image, not a thought. You just don't have anything to focus on. No, there's no target. It just. And what do you do then? It's very easy to just wait. But don't. If you're waiting, then you're not practicing. Then you're just throttling back and not meditating and not doing anything else. You're just waiting. And why do that? So this is actually, this is not a, a light point. This is rather an important point. And that is in any kind of practice of shamatha, and you name it, mindfulness of breathing, focusing on a Buddha image, stage of generation, any type of practice of shamatha, it's really imperative. If you want to really go deeper and deeper, develop your attention skills by way of shamatha, it's imperative to maintain an ongoing flow of cognizance, a flow of knowing and knowing and knowing and knowing. And it's not conceptual, but still, that clear, discerning awareness of what's arising in the present moment is still there. And if we're waiting, you're probably not cognizing anything, because there's nothing to do, so I'll just, until something happens. Well, do memorize, if you'd like to do this practice, do memorize what is the object of mindfulness in this practice. I said it before, but it's easy to forget. What is the object of mindfulness? It is the space of the mind, and whatever arises within that space. What arises? Objective appearances, subjective impulses. But what if, as you're doing the practice, you're just not seeing any objective appearances, images, thoughts, and so forth coming up, and you're looking for subjective impulses, and it just seems like clear. You're just, you're just not seeing anything. What do you do then? So, old-timers, what do you do then? Observe the space. And the space is something, it's not nothing. I, I just gave away the plot. But uh, the space is not nothing. The space, just like physical space, is not nothing. It's a physical space. Uh, the visual space. John, between you and me, can you s see any space? Yes. I can too. I don't have, I, I'm very clear. I don't have to think about it. But I'm very clear, when I look at your face, I am very clear that my nose is not pressed up to your nose. You can see it from my side, but I can see it this way. We're not, we're not that cozy. And so I can see there's something between me and you. 
between you and me. And I don't know what else to call it, it's space. And the Tibetan, in, in Buddhist philosophy, they call this baranang, the intervening space. And it's something you can see, you can perceive it, therefore it's impermanent, it's real, and has causal efficacy. It's not the mere absence of obstructing contact. A mere absence, here's one more point, something that exists and has no efficacy. The mere absence of obstructing contact, that's unconditioned space. That's permanent, unchanging, it exists and it's not real. Mm. Is there an elephant on my lap? Can you tell right now whether there's a, f I mean, full size elephant? Can you see? Yeah. Did somebody see? <laughs> Good imagination. <laughs> I'm talking about a real elephant, not an imaginary elephant. And the answer obviously is not. So there is an absence of an elephant on my lap. There, does that exist? Is, is there, in fact, an absence of an elephant on my, on my lap? The answer is yes. There's an absence of a lot of things on my lap. I can give more examples, but I think you already got it. And so that's true. It exists. There is an absence. Can you, can, you can you perceive the absence of an elephant on my lap? No, I can't. Can you conceptually know that there's an absence of, a la of an elephant on my lap? Sure. Conceptual mind comes in with a question. Elephant? No elephant. No elephant. You got it. But you didn't perceive it. Perception has no questions. The eyes have no perceptions, per questions. Visual perception has no questions. It just, what you see is what you get. So, I just find all of this so fascinating. I really do. So, we have three things going on here. Let's go really deep just for a moment. Back to something I referred to earlier. Ultimate, Dzogchen, Vajrayana view. Okay, the deepest view you find in, in Buddhism, as far as I can tell. And I am persuaded it is the deepest. And that is when you go to the ultimate ground, there are these three elements there, three, three constituents. Now, if you were there, you wouldn't see them as three different things. But from our perspective, this relative conceptual perspective, trying to make sense of that which is actually inconceivable, in that ultimate ground there's Dharmakaya. It is all-pervasive, it is omniscient, it is divine, it's transcendent consciousness. It's Rikpa, pristine awareness, it's the same transcending space, transcending time, and yet pervading time and pervading space, but not localized anywhere. And not even located in that narrow crevasse between the past and the future. That's how big the present is. It's not, it's not, it's not claustrophobic, jammed between the past and the future. It transcends the three times. So that's the consciousness. It's also called very subtle mind. So the Lama Zerpa students, this classic Galupa, not just Lama Zerpa. This is the very subtle mind. The indwelling mind of clear light is in fact the same as Dharmakaya. So there's one, you'll remember the other two. There's Dhammadhatu, that's the absolute space of phenomena. It is emptiness, it is shunyata, and those two are utterly of the same nature, primordially indistinct, you can't rip them apart. They're of the same nature. Dharmakaya, Dhammadhatu. And then there's that third element that undoubtedly is there, it's referred to many times, but sometimes people skip it. And it's called Yeshiki Lung, the energy of primordial consciousness. That energy is something, in an extremely subtle way, very subtle way, the very subtle prana, it is the very subtle prana. And that very subtle prana is very, very subtly physical, and the three of those, like the Trinity, all in one, one and all, they are all of a piece, they're internally in, uh, undifferentiated. We, from outside, we can talk about them as this, 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 but they're all coextensive of the same nature. And so that's on the ultimate level. So you can believe that or not, but that is exactly the view. Uh, we find in, in Vajrayana, we find it in Dzogchen. So there's the ultimate. Now let's come back where we live, for those of us who are not dwelling in pristine awareness and so forth. And we're about to engage in this practice, again, observing the mind. And on the medium level, not the coarse level, but the medium level, that subtle mind, we're going to call that substrate consciousness, just subtle mind. But the substrate consciousness, alaya vichnana, the subtle consciousness is aware of, is conscious of the substrate. That's why it's called substrate consciousness. It's quite cool. So when all of your senses have imploded, you've achieved shamatha, and you're seeing this vividly and lucidly with a thousand watt bulb, then there's on the one hand, you're illuminating substrate consciousness, which is of their nature of luminosity, and it is illuminating the space, which isn't in front of it, it's just co coextensive with. Substrate consciousness and substrate, coextensive, and that which illuminates, makes manifest, 
whatever appears in the substrate is the substrate consciousness. But it's not just empty space and consciousness. Because while, and why is that? Because that substrate is also permeated by, coextensive with, the subtle energy. Deepest level, very subtle energy. Primordial consciousness, dharmadhatu, absolute place of phenomena. The medium level, which often gets kind of overlooked and I think is extremely interesting. We have again a trinity. It's not ultimate, it's within samsara, but you have that space, the substrate, and that's permeated by the subtle energy, the subtle prana. And that's illuminated by substrate consciousness. And the three are all coextensive. Okay? Now, that sounds like theory, but this is testable theory, which is the kind I'm always, I was, I'm just getting too old to be too concerned with things that are not testable, even if it has to be a very high test. So where we're going to go right now is back to the, let's say, shamatha focused on the mind. So in, in when we do this practice, then you'll, I'm sure you'll recall, we'll settle body, speech, and mind first. We'll rest in that self-illuminating, self-knowing awareness that remains still. Shine its light, that is, direct the attention, on that sixth domain, the domain of the mind. So there's the consciousness part. And this is right now. We don't have to achieve, sham- we don't have to achieve shamatha to do this. Today, right now, there's the consciousness part. It's your mental consciousness. Yikinabhishyapa. Your mental consciousness. It's illuminating the space of the mind. The space of the mind, actually, interestingly enough, among the, you remember, so for those of you who know Buddhism, you remember the 18 ayatanas? So the, the, the six sense fields, the six faculties, and the six modes of consciousness, three times six, you remember that? And so the six sense consciousness arise independence upon the six faculties, and the domains that they illuminate are the six domains. And so the sixth type of consciousness is mental consciousness, it's very easy, yikinabhashepa. And then what it observes, the phenomena it observes, is simply called dharmas, phenomena. And then the space that is illuminated by and known by mental consciousness is called dharma datu. These are 18 datus. They're called 18 datus. Three times six, 18 datus. And the field for the mental consciousness is called dharma datu, simply the field, the domain of phenomena. Because actually mental awareness illuminates all kinds of things. But this is relative dharma datu. It's not, it's not shunyata. And so, right now in the session coming up, We'll take our mental consciousness, ordinary, coarse, human, right here. We're going to be focusing it on the Dharma Datu, the domain of experience that is illuminated by mental consciousness. And that's the domain. And then that domain is permeated by energy, prana. And so what we'll be observing then, in, and if we could do it optimally, we'd be absolutely single-pointedly zoned in on, like a laser, illuminating that field and watching whatever comes up, whatever appears. And then we will be observing not only the appearances that come up, but also when there is an interval, when we can't detect, it's not to say there aren't any, but we can't detect any appearances, we can't detect anything that's quite explicitly coming up subjectively, apart from awareness itself then during those intervals in this practice, we're going to emphasize something that is integral to the whole practice. It's not a separate practice. It's part of the whole practice, but easily overlooked. When you're not picking up any content, then you focus on that space itself, the the relative dharma datu. The datu of dharmas, phenomena. And we'll focus on that, and we will try to know it. Try to know the space from which all these mental events occur. If we ask, where are they? They're in the space of the mind. They're in the Dharma Dhatu. That's where they are. And then when they they fizzle out, when they disappear, where do they go? Well, they don't jump into another pond, like a frog. They dissolve right where they are, right? Hmm. So that's what we'll focus on. There was one more point, but maybe it won't come back. Hmm. So let's do that. 
We'll start with shamatha, and especially on those intervals, we'll really focus on that space and try to know it well. And then in the latter half, we'll go into vipassana. So this is going to be a very full session. Okay? Okay, let's find a comfortable position. Oh yeah, I remember, and it is important. Go ahead and sit, sit, sit down. Go ahead and find your posture. This is important though, it's not trivial. This Dharma Datu, the relative Dharma Datu, so we're not talking about shunyata, just this space in which mental perception illuminates phenomena and sees them, knows them. How big is it? And where is it? How big is it and where is it? That's a simple question. And we can answer that question. It's not just, oh, like that. We get a real answer. The space, the space of the mind, or Dharma Datu, it is wherever mental events take place. Mental events don't play, take place in the, don't take place elsewhere. They don't take place in the visual or the auditory or the tactile. Mental events are perceived by mental consciousness and therefore they take place in the domain of the mind. And how big is it? Well, here we really see where the rubber hits the road, we say in America, maybe here in the UK. And that is, is the space of the mind really inside the head? Because we hear so many times, thoughts are in your head, images in your head, emotions are in your hippocampus, anger is in the amygdala, your happiness is in the left prefrontal cortex. And okay, we keep on, it's just getting, to, you know, it's like Trump tell, saying for 40 times that Obama was born in Kenya. After a while, you start believing it, because after all, he said it so many times, it must be true. Except there's no evidence of that at all. Okay, that one made political agenda, over. <laughs> and coming back, there's no, there's no basis for that at all. Correlates, yes, but two things correlated don't have to be located in the same place. So where is and how big is this space of the mind? Well, I can illustrate that with an experiment. And this is my, this is my what do they call it? My uh, iconic one, there's another word for it. My special thing. Signature. signature. My signature exercise. Are you ready? I've only, been, I've only spoken to one group over the last 20 years. One group. That when I say, do you know what Mickey Mouse looks like? The hands went up. They didn't know. And it was a group of Tibetan nuns in northern India. <laughs> They'd never, Mickey who? <laughs> they, they, they didn't actually, you can't, you know, they didn't know what Mickey Mouse looks like. I'm not going to even ask you. <laughs> Everybody knows Mickey. Right? So I just want to get something familiar. But this is my icon. This is my signature piece. So just, just only take 10, 15 seconds. I'd like you right now, according to your ability, maybe really sharp, maybe not, but I'd like you to visualize Mickey Mouse right on top of my head, about this big, about four inches tall. And I'm going to keep my head still so he won't fall off. And in the stance, you know Mickey. Give him a big smile. And if you like, you can make him, make him say, Hi, kids. Okay, go ahead. I'll keep really still. He's standing right on top of my head. Big smile. And he can even put in an audio track. Hi, kids. You see him? You can visualize something, yeah? Image show up here? Hopefully, yes. You're not drawing a blank. Okay? Some people can visualize clearly, some not so much. But I can. I, I, can, I can see him. He's the Lord of my family, you know. Avalokiteshvara has Amitabha. And Lord of the... Mickey Mouse. And so, the Mickey Mouse that you perceive, obviously you're not perceiving it with your eyes, because there's no photons being emitted from a non-existent Mickey Mouse. So you're not seeing it with visual perception. That's quite clear. But it's not that nothing happened. When you visualize Mickey, you see some kind of an image. And it's way over here, right? It's here, right? It's, I didn't say visual on top of your head. I certainly didn't say visualize inside your head. I said visualize Mickey Mouse over here on the top of my head. That Mickey Mouse, are you seeing it? Well, I already said, it's perfectly obvious. You're seeing it with mental perception. You're creating it and seeing it with mental perception. You're knowing it with the cognizant aspect of mental consciousness, and you're illuminating it with the luminous aspect, the creative aspect of mental consciousness. Remember, consciousness is luminous and knowing, and the luminosity aspect is where its creativity is. 
visualizing Mickey Mouse, okay, if he appears, it's because your mind has illuminated it. And you know it's Mickey Mouse rather than Daffy Duck or Minnie Mouse with your cognizant aspect of consciousness. So then we can ask once again, where, where is the Mickey Mouse? Where is the Mickey Mouse? Please tell me, where is the Mickey Mouse? Victoria, where is the Mickey Mouse? In the space of the mind. In the space of the mind, but it's right above my head, right? And so the space of your mind is right above my head? I think it's the only answer. Because you're seeing your visualization, you're not seeing anybody else's. And you are visualizing it over here, not over there or inside your head. So the Mickey Mouse that you're seeing right here is occurring, of course, it can only be in one place. What other alternative is there? You're seeing a Mickey Mouse here with mental perception, not any other, and you're seeing it in the space of your mind, your Dhammadhatu, what else? And it's way over here. So for starters, the space of your mind is not located inside your head. It goes at least as far as the top of my head. Because wherever there's a mental event, it's taking place in the space of the mind, not outside it. So now you see, okay, space of your mind is at least this big. Now we'll finish this quickly. We're just going to jump, jump, jump. Has anybody ever seen the Big Dipper? Has anybody never seen the Big Dipper? For those of us living in, okay. Never seen it? You have to see it. It's quite cool. It's a Northern Hemisphere kind of thing. The Australians, God did not smile on them. <laughs> For the Southern Cross, yes, but the Southern, you know, people down there in Brazil and so forth, they don't get the Big Dipper. It's a, 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 people on top of the world. In any case, joking aside, Big Dipper is one of the easiest you know, things, forms to see in the sky and very easy to identify. Part of, two, of the, two of the stars point to the North, the North Star. Um, and if you've ever seen the Big Dipper, did you see it with your eyes? Did you see it with vis visual perception? With visual perception. And I would, I would beg to disagree, and here's why. If you're really in the scene, let there be just the scene. You're just seeing a lot of white dots up there. If you're not projecting anything, those, those stars that are the points for the Big Dipper, they're not connected. They're just stars. They're just points of light in the dark sky. And that's all the eye that picks up. Each one of them is emitting photons. The photons strike your retina. But there are no photons striking for the lines between those stars. Because those lines that make for a big dipper and not just a little array of, of independent stars, those lines are drawn by your mind. It's again the luminosity of your mind. Not visualizing Mickey Mouse, but visualizing a Big Dipper, where all of those points are connected. So the eyes can't pick those up, because the eyes don't pick up anything between the stars. They just get dots, and there's no projection on them, so they're just dots. There's no Dipper there. But it's so easy to see the Big Dipper, because we see that, oh yeah, there's the Big Dipper, and the mind immediately goes choo, 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 and, f and connects the dots. And so the Big Dipper, where does the Big Dipper that you see, where does that exist? In the space of your mind, it's not anywhere else. And yet, how far away are those stars? I don't know. Some are probably 100, 100 light years away, and one 10,000 light years away, and maybe one, who knows, when, we, when it could be a constellation, I don't remember. But very, very far, and of course, they're not in a plane. The stars, are, you know, they're not connected at all. They just happen to line up. And so, here's the simple point, that when you see the Big Dipper, you're seeing something that's created by your mind, inspired by dots, and then you fill in the blanks. That's how big the space of your mind is. 100 light years, 1,000 light years. There is no border to the space of your mind. So this is why it's a very good idea when you're observing the mind, the space of the mind, not to close your eyes. Because that will reinforce the superstition that your thoughts, images, emotions are behind your eyelids. And what could be, what could be wronger than that? Okay? So, enough ado. You're all settled in now. I feel like you should have some cookies and milk just before you head out. So let's find a comfortable position. We'll go right in.
the more relaxed at ease you become physically, the more unimpededly and effortlessly your breath will flow, the more effortless your respiration, the easier it will be to deeply set your mind at ease, your awareness and stillness, resting in its own natural clarity and cognizance. And as we enter into the main practice, as usual, let your eyes be softly open. But taking no interest in the visual field at this time, your gaze vacant. And taking interest only in one out of six domains, directing the full force of your attention to the mental domain, the space of the mind, and whatever arises within it. Rest in the stillness of your awareness, observing whatever movements take place within the space of the mind. Then before long, 
as you're attending with your closest attention, not distracted, not falling into dullness, as you attend to this base of the mind, you may not detect any distinct event taking place there that you can focus on, crystallize your awareness on. This can occur many times in a 24-minute session. So as soon as a thought or an image disappears, finishes, focus your attention very sharply right where it disappeared. We're going to call that domain the Dharmadhatu, the domain of phenomena perceived by mental consciousness. And so that we clearly apprehend it without engaging in any real vipassana investigation, but simply seeking to recognize it clearly, we'll pose a few simple questions. This domain of the mind, this space, this field, in which all manner of mental events, including dreams, occur, is it flat? Is it two-dimensional? Or does it have volume? Is it three-dimensional? Look at it closely. And I think there's a definitive answer to that question. Can you generate a three-dimensional image in this space? Can you imagine a locomotive coming down tracks, approaching you, coming closer and closer? Can you imagine a hummingbird flying away from you and then back towards you, to the left and the right? Can you imagine a cube? If you can, then you can know for sure this is not a flat screen. This is 3D. Is that true or not? Check for yourself. It's your space. It's for you. It's there for you. Your own private screening. This space, does it have a color? Is it black? Or is it blue, like blue screen in creating special effects? Is it white? I'll suggest an answer. If it were black, then anything you would see there would be tainted by black. It would be dark, or at least darkened. If it were white, then it would be pale. If it were blue, of course, it would have a bluish tinge, at least. So is it not safe to assume this 3D space is transparent, has no color of its own? Where is it located, this space of the mind? Where is it? Well, the answer is wherever mental events take place. They don't take place outside it. So where is it? Is it in front of you? But can you visualize something behind you? Can you visualize something beneath you, above you, to the left or right? If you can, then it's quite clear this space is all around you not just in front, and certainly not inside your head. Rather, if you're experiencing a subtle mental image of your head, that image is taking place within the space of the mind, which is infinitely larger, 
the space of the mind is not inside that image or that physical space. Space of the mind, does it have a shape? Is it a, is it a cube, a tetrahedron, a sphere? Does it have edges? Does it have a center and a periphery? If it has a center, where is it? Inside your head, in front of you? Where? And where is that periphery? Can you see it? And then finally, how big is it? Does it have edges, any borders? Or just does it extend outward in all directions with no border? As far as your imagination can reach. Welcome to the space of your mind in which all mental events take place. Everything that you perceive with the mind occurs in this space. Now within the space, let's return to the main practice, specifically and selectively focusing are just mental events, not visual, auditory, just mental. Thoughts and images, desires, emotions, whatever comes up in the space of the mind. From the stillness of awareness, observe whatever comes up. That would be shamatha, just observing. Tiny bit of commentary, should you do this for 8, 10, 12 hours a day, effectively, persistently. And over the weeks and the months, gradually, you'd find the whole flow of your awareness is siphoned away from the five sensory domains. They all shut down, no signal, no signal. The full light of your awareness, the full stream, the current, will illuminate only this one domain, the space of mental events. And over time, you'll find that the amount of mental events taking place there diminishes and diminishes. Thoughts subsiding, memories, fantasies. Activities of the mind subsiding as if you were falling asleep but you're radiantly aware. Become clearer and clearer. Until your coarse mind dissolves into the subtle mind, this coarse dhammadhatu melts into the substrate. And that substrate permeated by the substrate consciousness is not a dead zone, it's not just empty. It's pregnant, it's fertile, ready to give rise to all kinds of appearances. Dreams, thoughts, images, everything can emerge from, spring forth from this three-dimensional field. So now as we shift over to Vipassana, a 
Observing this space of the mind, this Dharma Dhatu right now. When mental events arise, thoughts or images, observe closely. Where do they come from? Do they come in from the left or the right? Or do they just manifest right out of the space of the mind? Perhaps we can liken the space of the mind to a stage for a play in which the actors just suddenly materialize, not walking in from stage left or right. They just manifest right where they are on the stage. And then they perform their roles on the stage. And they don't exit stage left or right, they just dissolve right where they were in this three-dimensional stage of the mind. Is that so or not? Observe closely. How do these mental events arise? Where do they come from? Where are they located? And when they vanish, where do they go? If you were an avid lucid dreamer, you could rest in the substrate consciousness and observe where do dreams emerge from? Where are they located? And when the dream comes to an end, where do they dissolve? Same question, same cinema. The remaining few minutes of this session, let's relax. Settle back into shamatha, utterly at ease, at rest. Your awareness still. And quietly, but discerningly, observing the space of the mind, this three-dimensional space. Observe whatever arises within space. Observe it play itself out, perform its role. And then dissolve back into the space. That space filled with a kind of potential energy that ever so easily takes on form. And then the form melts back into the space.
these forms you can perceive, and they do have causal efficacy, don't they? They can influence each other. One image can lead to another. That can lead to a thought. That can lead to a desire. That to an emotion, which can arouse another image or memory. They're real. They influence things. They influence your brain. Your brain influences them. Observe the causal interactions occurring in this matrix. So before we turn, we turn to the notes, I'd like to make one more point that I think might be helpful. To me, it, to me it seems a bit important. And that is when we speak of the Dhamma Datu, this relative domain in which we see phenomena, and the phenomena are all those that can be perceived with mental awareness. Well, of course, there are mental events that can only be perceived with mental awareness, mental images, dreams, and so forth. You can't see them or hear them. <coughs> <coughs> But also, when I direct my attention to John, my, my visual gaze, and I'm visually perceiving the form of John, the colors of his shirt and so forth, so that's visual perception. But when I turn my attention to him, then as I mentioned before, mental awareness is piggybacking right along the visual awareness. And so that I, am, I know this is John, I, 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 I'm seeing him mentally, 
and not just picking up visual impressions. And likewise, if I hear the sound of Victoria's voice, the ears just hear noise. But mentally, oh, Victoria, Victoria. And so each of the five physical senses is locked to an, into its own domain. And that is visual perceptions sees only in the visual domain and what arises in that is shapes and colors. And the auditory consciousness is locked into the auditory domain. It only picks up noises. It doesn't pick up smells or tastes. And likewise, the olfactory, the gustatory, the tactile, tactile perception picks up only that which arises in the somatic field. It doesn't pick up smells or tastes. So the five are kind of imprisoned in their own cinema. They have a ticket only for their own cinema, right? But mental consciousness, on the one hand, also has its own domain for which no, no technology has any, domain, any access, and the visual, the sensory, and so forth have no access. And that is, for example, right now I'm visualizing a certain type of fruit. I am actually visualizing a certain type of fruit. I just chose one. It was an, I haven't visualized this for a long time. Um, which one is it? I made it hard this time. I know for sure, because I can see it. I can still see it. I can see it's interior and it's exterior. Oh, nice try. <laughs> I would avoid that one. The associations would creep. Guava. Now you didn't know because it's not. Ex it's there for me, but it's not there for you unless you're clairvoyant. But it was guava, and I know that for sure. I could be lying to you, but why would I? And I'm not. I, I saw guava, and so that image is something generated that only my perception can see, apart from paranormal things like extrasensory perception and so forth. So mental perception has its own domain for which it has proprietorship, sole ownership, only it has access. No technology, there's not any, any technology, MRI, EEG, that could possibly detect a guava. Can't do it. And so on the one hand, mental consciousness has its own unique domain, cinema number six. But unlike the other five sensory modes of consciousness, all of which are purely perceptual. Visual perception never thinks or remembers, and that's true for all of the five sensory. They're only perceptual. Mental can be perceptual as well. We've seen it. I didn't, I didn't think about guava. I saw the mental image of guava. I perceived it. I didn't infer it. I saw it with mental perception. And so mental consciousness, unlike the other five, it can be perceptual, we've been doing it a lot, observing thoughts, observing images, and so forth. That's observation. That's not inference, it's not thinking about, it's observing. So mental consciousness has this dual role, and that is there's mental perception that simply sees what is being presented. What's being presented is real. That image of a guava is as real as anything else. But also, very rapidly and involuntarily, mental consciousness gets hooked up with conceptualization. And then whatever we're apprehending with a conceptual mind is by way of these generic ideas. Right? So the point here that I want to get to, it's really simple, is that this sixth domain uh, out of the 18 datus, not ayatanas, but datus, the dharma datu, that in, in fact is all-inclusive. Because visual imagery can be mentally perceived. And sounds can be mentally perceived. Again, piggybacks. And so all of the appearances arising in the five physical senses can be detected with mental. And the mental has its own unique domain. It's like the king's domain. No poachers. Nobody else can come in there. Only the royal people can come in there. And so this is why the Dhammadhatu is all-inclusive. And that is, it includes visual imagery, sound, smell, taste, touch, and so forth, because they too can be seen and illuminated by mental consciousness. But within this all-encompassing Dharmadhatu, there is a sub-cinema, because that, that covers all six cinemas. Mental consciousness can, can, can go into all of them. But then it has its own one, and that we'll simply call mental space, because that's where mental events take place. So, so then when the person who just left suggested that she can see the Big Dipper, well, that was not a silly answer. I suggested it's incorrect. But we do have a sense, I'm, look, I can, I, can, I can photograph it with my camera lens. It's right there, I can see it. Yeah, it is, the Big Dipper is appearing in your visual field. The dots are there. But the dots are connected only with mental awareness. 
So you're not seeing the Big Dipper connected, connecting all those dots. You're not seeing the Big Dipper with visual perception, but you are seeing it with mental perception in the visual field. Because it's superimposing, you're superimposing the lines connecting the dots in exactly the same way that you superimposed Mickey Mouse on top of my head. And so, say, so, but how is that possible? Well, the visual appearance of my face, that's, that's in the visual domain, clearly, perceived with visual perception. But the mind sees it too. So the mind knows where to locate my head, the visual form of my head. And then the mind says, I'll put Mickey Mouse right on top. There we are. So that's phenomenology. Phenomenology. But I thought this, this segue is really quite beautiful into the next point in the notes. It's a German physicist named uh, Henning Gentz. And I don't give the source here, but the, I, I read his book very carefully. And I'm pretty sure the title was Nothingness. It's a very good, very mainstream. There's nothing, this is not airy fairy or new age physics. This is absolutely mainstream quantum field theory. And there are books written on this. I've read a number of them because my undergraduate thesis, which is about 500 pages, was on this the nature of empty space and the energy of empty space. So I got very familiar with that. So here's what he says, and see, and this is straight physics, you know, it's, it's 20th century physics, uh, and very much in quantum mechanics. Um, so see whether this resonates with what you just did. He writes real systems. Now, he, when he means real, he, real like Sautrantica means real. Causal efficacy. Causal efficacy. Real systems are, in this sense, excitations of the vacuum. Real systems are configurations of matter and energy. That's, that's a real system. Here's a chunk of matter. Here's an here's a electromagnetic field. Here's ge energy being generated by a, by a power plant. These are all real systems of configurations of matter and energy. Those are real systems. Real systems are, in this sense, excitations of the vacuum, much as surface waves in a pond are excitations of the pond's water. The vacuum in itself is shapeless, but it may assume specific shapes. In doing so, it becomes a physical reality, a real world, causal efficacy. And maybe quantum mechanical fluctuations, fluctuations of this ground energy, fluctuations of space itself, the energy of space, it's called the zero-point energy of the vacuum. Maybe quantum mechanical fluctuations initiated not only the stuff our world was made of prior to inflation, it's a very early phase of, of the cosmos when there's this rapid expansion of space-time. So maybe, it, maybe these quantum mechanical fluctuations initiated not only the stuff our world was made of prior to inflation, but also space-time itself. These, quanti these fluctuations of the energy this energy of space, maybe this actually gave rise to the expansion of space-time itself, as well as everything in it. The galaxies, particles, waves, fields, and so forth. Maybe the true vacuum, the true nothing of philosophy and religion should be seen as a state wholly innocent of laws, space, and time. So for those coming from a theistic background, the whole notion of creation coming ex nihilo, out of nothing, Maybe not nothing, nothing, because nothing, nothing is nothing. Nothing comes out of nothing. But maybe a very pregnant nothing. Possibility. So he's a straight physicist, very bright, very sharp, and willing to consider things outside of the realm of physics alone. I found this really, really fascinating. And I drew on this a lot in my thesis. It's, the, the physics part was published in a book called Choosing Reality. So, and then we have two well-known, well, one very well-known person, another one, Carl Jung, everybody knows, the Swiss psychologist, and then physicist Wolfgang Pauli, uh, German, Nobel laureate, and among the brightest of the bright, of that first generation of, of Heisenberg, Schrödinger, and so forth and so on. He was in that generation, the, the fantastic generation, and he was also, among his peers, he was thought to be frighteningly smart. He just intimidated people by his intelligence. And so the two of these linked up. Wolfgang Pauli, the physicist par excellence, Carl Jung needs no explanation. And they proposed, as they're putting their heads together, of really cutting-edge psychologists, Carl Jung, 
and then Wolfgang Pauli, knowing quantum mechanics inside and out, they propose that mind and matter emerge from a breakdown of the psychophysical symmetry of the unus mundus. They're proposing here that there's a deeper dimension of reality, unus mundus, kind of one world, one unitary world, that has a symmetry to it. But when the symmetry is broken, then out of that arises the bifurcation of mind and matter. In this model, mental processes emerge as psychic manifestations of archetypes. So there will be archetypes in that unus mundus that when they're triggered and manifest, they manifest as mental states, and physical laws emerge as physical manifestations of archetypes. Within that same unus mundus, there are also archetypes of the physical, and when they're triggered, they manifest as the physical. But this is a realm underlying this world of mind and matter, subject and object, but, but out of which this is all an effulgence or like a holographic display. So they work this out in a correspondence. Uh, Harald Atmansbacher has done a lot of tra work translating into English and, and making this available in German. Uh, and I invited Harald Atmansbacher to a conference I organized at Oxford some years back. It's just very intriguing. But Wolfgang Pauli especially was going right, way out on a limb here um, because physicists dealing with archetypes and so forth, that's kind of frowned on to woo-woo. And so his whole correspondence with Carl Jung he wouldn't allow any of it to be published until after he was dead, because he feared ridicule. Ridicule is the kiss of death in science. If you lose your reputation, you've lost everything. So like Copernicus, who didn't let his theory be published until after he was dead for fear of excommunication, Wolfgang Pauli did the same thing, not for fear of excommunication from the Roman Catholic Church, fear of excommunication by the Church of Scientific Materialism. They frowned on that kind of thing. Then the mathematician, he's re recently retired from Oxford, Roger Penrose, probably the most famous mathematician alive. He's clearly brilliant. He worked very closely with Stephen Hawking. He's still alive. Hawking has passed away. But in his popular book, and truly, I mean, a, a, a genius of very high level, Roger Penrose, world-renowned, he writes in his book, The Emperor's New Mind, I imagine that whenever the mind perceives, perceives, that's an interesting word, right? He knows what he means. I imagine that whenever the mind perceives a mathematical idea, we've been perceiving our ideas for a couple of days now, he's speaking of highly trained professional mathematicians like himself, who he says, perceive mathematical idea. It makes content contact, he's proposing, with Plato's world of mathematical concepts. When one sees, again he puts it, but with inverted commas, when one sees a mathematical truth, one's consciousness breaks through into this world of ideas and makes direct contact with it. You are perceiving truths, not imagining or inferring them. When mathematicians communicate, this is made possible by each one having a direct route to truth, a domain of reality, the consciousness of each being in a position to perceive mathematical truths directly through this process of seeing. He's making this point really strongly. It's not just an intellectual gig. It's not just inference, it's not speculation, it's seeing at a different, le a different level, a subtle level. And the faculty by which you're seeing, of course, is mental perception. So, is in a position to perceive mathematical truths directly through this process of seeing, each, since each can make contact with Plato's world directly, a world of pure forms, a world of pure math. They can more readily communicate with each other than one might have expected. The mental images that each one has when making this platonic contact might be rather different in each case, but communication is possible because each is directly in contact with the same externally existent platonic world. So not all mathematicians agree, but many do, and this traces right back to Plato and back to Pythagoras. And so it's not a new age I This is a very old age idea. Doesn't mean it's true, but this is really from one of the most brilliant mathematicians alive. And he's suggesting exactly, he raises the, the point, as many have, when we, and he's a physicist. He worked very closely, a mathematical physicist. He worked very closely with Stephen Hawking, as I mentioned. And what many physicists have noted and pondered is why on earth the laws of physics, so-called governing this physical world, why are they so precisely mathematical? I mean, exactly precisely. 
The inverse square of law, inverse square law of gravity is not more or less inverse square law. It's inverse square law to 100 or 300 de decimal points. It's exactly that. And other mathematical laws, they are precisely mathematical. Why should that be? Why not more or less? And this comes up a lot. The mathematical laws of nature, the physical laws of nature are mathematical and they are precisely mathematical. And one of the major speculations coming out, and it is, it is a hypothesis coming out, and it's em embraced by Penrose, is the reason this physical world is governed by laws that are so precisely mathematical is because it's emerging from a realm that is pre precisely mathematical, a realm of pure math, a realm of pure geometrical forms. If we go back to Pythagoras, that emerges from a realm of pure algebra, or pure number. And so desire realm form, realm formless realm. It's interesting, I think. But all all of this goes back to the dreamlike nature of this reality right now. Things are not as they seem, and nothing of what we're seeing is really out there, but all of this is emerging from a deeper substrate, the form realm, and this is dreamlike. It's dreamlike. And a number of very mainstream physicists are speaking of the holographic model of the universe many are talking about. The universe that we perceive through the Hubble telescope and so forth and so on, all of this is a holographic display. It appears, but it's not there, and it's emerging from a deeper dimension of reality. It's a very common theme now. Variations on that theme, this is one of them. Now, if we go back to Buddhism briefly, and then we'll come back again, back and forth. There's a very famous line that I've memorized from the Abhidhamma Kosha, because it's so easy to memorize. And, the, and it goes into Tibetan, it's so easy, listen. Jikten lala lele jung. That's it. It's one, ver one line from the Abhidhamma Kosha, 5th century, written by Vasubandhu, Asanga's younger brother. And it's classic Buddhism. He's speaking from the Vaibhashika perspective, but it's classic Buddhism. And jikten lala lele jung means, literal translation, the myriad worlds, the many worlds, emerge from karma. Jikten lala means myriad, more than one, many, many, many worlds plural, le le jung, emerge from karma. Whose karma? Buddhist karma, or God, or fate? No, actually the, the karma of individual sentient beings. And so saying that the, this world, this manifest world, is not created by, in the Buddhist view, true or false, it's not created by some outside entity. It's not just created just because, because nobody has an explanation for the Big Bang and what triggered it. It's not just happening, but actually it's generated. The many worlds, not a universe, but the many worlds are generated by the karma of individual sentient beings and collectively groups of sentient beings. And they're generated by karma. And they manifest, they manifest in the substrate of each sentient being. So it's many worlds. When all is said and done, actually, in this Buddhist worldview, I just don't see any way to avoid this conclusion. There's one world for every sentient being. It is just the opposite of notion. Somebody else created one for everybody to get into or pop them into it. It's one view. Maybe it's right, but they're not the Buddhist view. Nobody did it to us. Nobody punished us. No, nobody out there created us. But in the Buddhist view, these worlds are actually brought into existence by the actions of sentient beings. And the world that you are existing in was brought forth by your karma in past life. But of course, our karma is not just individual. We're not just walking around in our own individual solipsistic worlds. As in this gathering here, we are right now engaging a lot of collective karma. And we often do. Villages, countries, companies, families. There's individual karma, but there's lots and lots of collective karma. And so when there's collective karma, then you have shared environments. And that is shared, that is, each environment is emerging from the substrate of each sentient being, but a great deal of commonality. And that's because of the common karma, common karma manifesting. So this would suggest, if this Buddhist worldview is right, and I'm not asking anybody to believe it, but you might be interested, that in this, in this view, the, the very standard terminology used for the universe and its sentient inhabitants, or world systems, like a planet, an inhabited planet, and the inhabitants of that planet, the Tibetan is nu, ju, and nu 
is the inanimate physical environment, and that's called, and nut means vessel. It's a vessel. And the sentient beings who inhabit it, and that's human beings and animals, and in the biggest, bigger worldview, predators and hell beings and asuras and devas and so forth, all the kind of sentient beings. The sentient beings who inhabit a world system, they are called chu. And chu means like the, the nutriment, the vital essence, the juice, what it's all about. Why do you have a vessel? So it can hold the juice. The nectar, the, you know, the juice, the nutritive essence. And the vessels, the physical environments, are created by the sentient beings. In other words, life is not an accident. There wouldn't be any physical universe in this unless there were life creating karma that then manifests in physical environments. So is there anything like that in modern physics with no reference to Buddhism whatsoever, just straight physics? And it comes to another anomaly that many physicists have pointed out, including world-class ones like John Wheeler, who will be cited in a moment. He's right up there with Richard Feynman. He's one of the greatest of the great in the 20th century, latter half. Uh, and that is another observation of physicists. And that is when they look at the mass of carbon, the freezing point of water, a lot of constants in this universe, the the laws of gravity, and many, many others, they note that there's something very strange going on here, and that had any one of those been just a little bit off, life as we know it would never have occurred. That had to be just so, and that had to be just so, and that had to be just so, just so, and then life as we know it, given those already being in place, then life can emerge. But if you tweak one, everything just doesn't happen. So it's led some very first-rate mainstream physicists to wonder, is life really an accident here? Or, and if you're a theist, as John Barrow and Frank Tipler are, they're Christian and they're very good physicists, there's no contradiction there, they're Christian, then this fits right into a theistic worldview. God created the universe for the sake of life, not as an afterthought. But the whole universe was designed to provide an environment for life to be created, a theistic view. It's not the Buddhist view, but there it is. It's certainly very reasonable. And the Buddhist counterpart would be, it's not some outside God did it. Rather than a monarchy, the king of heaven, God creating the whole place and then putting us into it, rather a democracy, that all the sentient beings are creating their own environment by their karma coming to maturation individually and collectively. But either way, whether it's the Buddhist way or the Christian way, the anomaly is there, and it's really created... A number of books have been written by it. One physicist I studied with at Amherst wrote a whole book on this, The Anthropic Principle, that the universe is designed in such a way to make it habitable by sentient beings as we know them. And so... It's called the anthropic principle, and that is there is a set of fundamental physical constants that are such that had they been very slightly different, even a tiny bit different, the universe would have been devoid of intelligent life. Suggesting, how can that be an accident? So many, all lined up, perfectly aligned to create the circumstances in which life can emerge. John Wheeler, again world class, he and Richard Feynman in America, Feynman on the west coast at Caltech, John Wheeler at Princeton on the East Coast, they were the two pillars of theoretical physics in the latter half of the 20th century in the United States. World class. So no flake. John Wheeler says, according to the principle, the anthropic principle, a life-giving factor lies at the center of the whole machinery and design of the world. And the two people who wrote kind of the definitive book on this, Barrow and Tipler, they write, there exists one possible universe designed, and they do put it in inverted commas, designed with the goal of generating and sustaining observers. Again, inverted commas. So, this is coming from straight physics and trying to make intelligible these constants of nature that enable life to emerge. So it's just the opposite of the view that still is dominant in the media and most of science, and that just life just happened. You know, go figure. And ever since Darwin formulated his brilliant theory, he commented 
that although his theory accounted for the, very, the way that species evolve and mutate without knowing anything about DNA, that came later, but simply survival and adaptation to a changing environment. And then species change, as he found in the Galapagos and in Australia and so forth. He saw this purely in terms of natural selection. And his theory explained how over a course of long, long time, more than 8,000 years, millions of years, many millions of years, species mutate, mutate, adapt, 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 and we're continuing to adapt right now. We will see, here's a tiny political footnote, the changes we're bringing about on the natural environment now, starting about 150 years ago, when we started really liking fossil fuels, the impact we've had on the environment over the last 150 years is, is more dramatic than anything that's occurred on the planet since 65 million years ago when the meteor hit and wiped out 75% of the life on the planet. We've done something comparable and we're doing more. The planet hit, it's finished. But we've wiped out, what is it, 60% of the animal life on the planet in the last 40 years. If you're watching the headlines, you see what we human beings are doing to the Brazilian rainforest right now that provide one-fifth of the oxygen for the planet. We're burning it off. And global climate change, decimation of natural habitat, wiping out of, of, of wildlife right, left, and center like there's just no tomorrow, emptying the ocean of fish, filling it with plastic. Uh, and we're seeing, I mean, the, the, the impact on the wild fluctuations and variations of the climate. Uh, we have done this, of course, that's beyond any reasonable doubt. Politicians pretend to think otherwise, but they're just jockeying for power. And so it remains to be seen. There's a little bit of, it's not politics, it's not conservative or liberal, but we are changing our environment now so fast, breathtakingly fast, that it really is an open question whether we can adapt to this changing environment and even survive. Because ice ages come and go over thousands and thousands of years, and you, you develop more hair, you lose your hair, and so forth. But when it's taking place within a matter of decades, genetic mutation and natural selection, forget about it. So if we're going to survive, it's going to have to be in some very ingenious ways. Because right now we're imperiling our own existence as a civilization and just wiping out wildlife like there's no tomorrow. So. So there we are. Um, but the standard view is, oh, I was mentioning Darwin. So his theory does a wonderful explication of once you have life, how it mutates, changes, diversifies, and so forth. He's brilliant. But Darwin was such a thoughtful man, uh, and he very candidly acknowledged, I have no theory whatsoever about how life started. None. And it's possible God did it. He stopped being a Christian. But he didn't become an atheist. He just wound up with a question mark, I think more agnostic than anything else. But he said there is no scientific theory, certainly not in his time. How did life start on this planet? What was that first living being? If it's a plant form, and if we assume they're non-conscious, okay, but it's alive, and the first animals that are conscious, what started that? And he said, I have no answer, we have no scientific answer, maybe it was God. And since then, that's 150 years ago. Since then, there's been a wide variety of theories, and they, they're all different, about how life first emerged about three and a half billion years ago. But none of them have been demonstrated to be true. They're just very interesting speculations. You've probably heard of some of them. But, what was it, 50 years ago, when the chemists, biochemists, were able to create RNA, you remember that? They'd create an environment that would be hot and they would put in, they'd put in amino acids and they'd cook them and they'd get RNA coming out. And they whoa, now we figured out how life happened. And they were just sure within 10, 15 years, RNA, DNA, and then boop, human beings were created the first single-celled living organisms. They were sure they were going to do it. Totally sure. That now we figured out how life happened. We just did it in the laboratory. And I asked a first-rate biochemist, well, this is now 50 years later, how did that turn out? And he said, it's like having a, whole, having a dissembled watch, just screws and glass and this and that and springs laid out on the table and saying you're building a clock. Now you just have a bunch of screws. 
And so all they've come up with, they actually they made virtually no progress at all since then. They were so hopeful, so confident. Ah, we figured it, we're gonna make life. We are now gods, we'll create life and we'll do it. Well, they know how to mutate. We know about cloning and DNA manipulation and genetic this and genetic that. They're right back to that. But there's a nice joke I like a lot. So in the joke to biochemists, you know, hot shots in DNA and all of this, they encounter God, they have this meeting with God. And they tell him, they tell him God, God, you know, we're as good as you. We can make, we can make, uh, we can make life too. You did, we can too. And God said, oh, really? Huh? That's impressive. Uh, tell me how you do it. And they said, good. Well, just give us some dirt. And God said, make your own dirt. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Uh, so all of that actually hasn't panned out. They keep on thinking, it's just over the hill, just over the hill, but they still haven't come even close to organizing inorganic matter and having it come alive. It's a mystery and that's just the fact of it. And that's just living organisms, like a really single-celled, non-conscious, you know, amoeba or something like that. But then if we ask the question, consciousness, when did the first conscious organism emerge, appear? Had to have, five billion years ago, I think we can assume there were no conscious living organisms, carbon-based organism on the planet. It was really a hostile environment, volcanoes and all that kind of stuff. But since five billion years, when this solar system came into existence, from five billion till now, there must have been a first conscious organism. How did that come about? Where did, who, who was his mom and dad? <laughs> or how did it come about? How did the first, first simple organism become conscious? And the answer is, there's no theory at all. So there's no workable theory, no testable theory for the origins of life, and no theory at all for the origins of consciousness. At least life you can measure, but consciousness you can't measure scientifically. So we're completely in the dark. So that's just a little bit of, I think, cross-pollination to look at interesting parallels between Buddha's view that's been around since the time of the Buddha and some very, very interesting recent theories, but even going back to Pythagoras and so forth, and it's all on the same theme. This is in the context of dream yoga and lucid dreaming, that whatever the world may be, it is not as it appears. That seems absolutely certain. And I think physicists would say, a lot of physicists would say, this world that we're experiencing, including galaxies and inflationary period of the universe and expansion of the universe and dark matter and dark energy and so forth, all of this world that seems so real, so concrete, so absolutely out there, it's an illusion. It's an illusion. That's mainstream physics. That it's actually there like it appears. I don't think I, think I, I, don't think I know one single theoretical physicist that believes that anymore. From mainstream, really cutting-edge physics, this is dreamlike. And then we can ask, how like a dream is it? And how is it different from a dream? And that's where the real Vipassana comes in. Because this isn't a dream, at least not from our perspective. From a Buddhist perspective, this may indeed be a dream. But from our, from our perspective, it's dreamlike. So, that is Sautrantika. And Sautrantika is going to be the most sophisticated, it is the most sophisticated, theoretical, um, how do you say, formulation of metaphysical realism in Buddhism. And so everything's real. Physical world is real, mind is real, appearances are real, information is real, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all real, and it's only things that are inherently existent. Some of you know Buddhism already. It's only things that are inherently existent that have causal efficacy. They're the only ones that matter. The other ones, they may exist, but only because we say so. Mere convention, mere designation, merely because we agree, but nothing more. And so, my American citizenship, it's true. But it doesn't have any causal efficacy. It's only people believing in it that has causal efficacy. The value of currency, it exists only because people believe. But there's nothing in that paper that gives it any value at all. And so to see that distinction, it's very easy. It's, it's setting up, for, for those of you read ahead in the notes, this is the finest formulation, the most intelligent that I've seen of metaphysical realism and the distinction between real and real and not real but existent and then not existent at all. Uh, and so that will do. 
and then after our break, I think now's the time, after our break, then we'll shift on to a deeper questioning. And for your questions tonight, I would invite you, number one, any questions or comments, please make it directly germane to this, because time is very short. Uh, but also I invite you uh, to look at what we've looked at so far, especially the Satrantika, the Satrantika view. This is real, this is causally efficacious, this is perceived, this is only imagined, and so forth. You have the big picture there. And then using your own intelligence, whether informed by Buddhism or not, Either way, just your own intelligence. Can you punch any holes in it? Can you see any flaws? Because it looks pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, from my perspective, that, this really makes sense. Does that mean it's flawless, that you can't, you can't torpedo it here, punch big holes into it? And at the end of the 19th century, some of the most brilliant people in Europe, because we were pretty much dominating science at that time, some of those, most of the most brilliant physicists in the late 19th century felt we're pretty much done here. This is classical physics. We have Newton, we have James Clerk Maxwell, we have thermodynamics. We're pretty much done here. This is impeccable, it's complete. There's not much more to be done in describing the physical universe because we've done it. So find something else to go into, you know. And these are not silly people. So they thought it was pretty much flawless. There was nothing more to be done. But there were a couple of things to be done. There were little clouds on the horizon. Uh, one was black box radiation that triggered, objectively, it was a trigger for quantum mechanics by way of Max Planck. And then there was just Einstein's imagination. It's just his imagination. What would the world look like? A thought experiment. He was famous for that. And he came up with thought experiments I think nobody ever had before. What would it be like? They didn't know about photons. He, he created that idea. But there in the early 20th century, very early 20th century, no notion of photons, but James Clerk Maxwell and company had developed this very sophisticated theory of light, light waves, propagation, the four, four equations, which I studied in detail, so I understood them entirely, just for their sheer beauty. I asked the professor, give me 14 weeks, I want to understand those equations. And I did, and they are really incredibly beautiful. There's a t-shirt that shows his four equations, and it says, God said, and there was light. You know, it's quite cute. And so that was done. James Clerk Maxwell had come up with his four equations. Newton was his three. And we have all these other fields, thermodynamics and so forth and so on. They said, hey, we're done here. This is flawless. It's impeccable. And then that rascal Einstein said, if I should hitch a ride on an electromagnetic field, if I should just jump onto one with a, with a harness and ride that electromagnetic field through space, traveling at 186,000 miles per second, what would the universe look like? Does that thought come up to you? Does it, is that a kind of <laughs> daily chit-chat that's come up? Yeah, I've been thinking about that. And, no, I think it was the first one to think about that. What would it look like? Out of that came relativity theory, with a rather brilliant mind behind it. So, can you find any flaws in the Satrantika? Because the finding of the flaws in the classical gave rise to two simultaneous revolutions in physics. One on the big level, space and time, and one on the, on the fundamental constituents of physical reality, that elementary particles are not little tiny BBs, little tiny packets of chunky stuff. And everybody believed they were. From Democritus on, little chunky stuff, you get a lot and you get big chunky stuff. And space time is absolute. And those two things are now dead as a doornail. The revolution has happened, you can't go back. No absolute space-time and no little chunky stuff at the ground of reality. It isn't there. That they know. What is there, not so certain. And so can you punch holes into Satrantika and maybe see where the revolution went from there in Buddhism? Have some fun. If something comes up, let me know. And let's come back at... Mm, 40 minutes past the hour. We'll go back to meditation. See you then.